James 4, 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boastings is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. May God commit the reading of his word to our minds, hearts, and our wills tonight. We've entitled this, Do We Truly Obey God's Will? The theme is, Obedience to God's Will Marks a Christian. Now, the fourth verse of the hymn, Trust and Obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Now, that's a mark of a believer. But in truth... In truth, remember what I said before, that in truth, when is that actually going to occur? In glory. When you and I are glorified, then that will totally be a true statement. You know what it reminds me of is when you go to Exodus 24. Remember that covenant ratification? And Israel had the law of God from Mount Sinai, and they're going to ratify the covenant, and the people are just, boy, you know, the momentum is just there and everything else, and the emotion is there, the high and all that. All that the Lord has commanded, we will do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. It isn't long, you've got the golden calf and everything else under the sun. See, And it's just like you and I, same thing. We sing that hymn, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. He drew me closer to his side, I sought his will to know. And in that will, and now I, now I abide, wherever he sends, I'll go. Wherever he sends, I'll go, wherever he sends, I'll go. I'll love my Christ, I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he sends, I'll go. And you and I can say, boy, that sounds good, and we can stand up and we say that, and we puff our chest out and we go, oh, yes, Lord. We walk out the door and it isn't very long, and what happens? We're just like the Israelites in Exodus 24. We've all been there. We've all been there. Um, it's interesting. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan died in 1945. You know, he's at Westminster Chapel and, and uh, co-preached with Martin Lloyd-Jones um, before he retired. But he said, when you follow Christ, he says, there's two things that are required when you follow Christ and do his will. Two things. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Now, he said, you can't obey unless you trust. Ah, but you can trust in a general way and never obey. Now, how many of us, and was grown up in the, in the church, sat in the church pew years and years on end, that if we're honest in our heart of hearts, we won't have a raise of hands. If we're all honest, we'll all raise our hands, but we won't have a raise of hands. But if we've been there, done that. We can trust in a general way, but not follow. We got the answers. We know it. But we also know little gray areas we think, or we can wiggle here or waggle there and not truly obey. Remember, obedience, faith in exercise, directed by the divine will, responding to divine authority. See. Um, do we truly obey God's will? Obedience to God's will marks a Christian. Now, when James gets into this, how do people respond to God's will? He gives four responses. It's interesting to me in these verses, he gives three negative and one positive. Does that remind you of anything in Scripture? The what? The seeds. We've got the unresponsive heart. We've got the unresponsive heart in the hardened soil. We've got the superficial heart, the one that grows up in the stones, is choked out. We've got the worldly heart, the one that grows and the thorns come in and choke it out. 
Oh, and then we got the good ones. Some yield 30, 60, and some 100. You got three negative and one positive. So here, how do people respond to God's will? You got four responses, three negative and one positive. Put that in the bigger picture. What does that say about all the professors of Christ? Exactly. The doctrine of the remnant. From one page of scripture, from one end to the other. The doctrine of the remnant. Wide is the gate, narrows the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrows the gate, few there be that find it. Okay. Now, when we look, let's define a few things first before we really get going here. I'm just warming up. What does it mean by God's will? God's will. Okay? God's will is His eternal delight in Himself, His being and attributes, and in His creatures. For his own name's sake. Okay? God's will is his eternal delight in himself, his being and attributes, and in his creatures for his own name's sake. So what does that tell you? What is the chief objective? The chief aim of God's will. His glory, right. His glory. So Isaiah 43, 7, even everyone that is called by my name, for I've created him for my glory, that's why you and I are created in the first place, to glorify God. Uh, John Calvin's life verse, Romans eleven thirty six, For of him, from him, and to him are all things, to him be glory forever and ever, amen. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether we eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Right. His glory. His glory. So in other words, make his name manifest. His perfections. Uh, to, re, to extol them. Uh, to delight in them. So God's will is his eternal delight. In himself, his being and attributes. And in his creatures for his own name's sake. Now. When scripture speaks of God's will. It speaks of it in three different ways. His sovereign efficacious will his preceptive will and his dispositional will now sovereign efficacious will is God says it that settles it it's going to be accomplished Okay. Um, think of God's word, Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing wherein I sent it. See, His preceptive will, now this is his command. His command. Now, can you violate God's commands? Yes. For a time. For a time. Psalm 50, 21. Uh, these things you have done and I kept silent. You thought I was altogether such a one as yourself, but I will reprove you and I will set things in order. See? So his perceptive will. You can do it for a time, but not with impunity, because it does come a time when God will judge. That's his will of command. And then his dispositional will is that which pleases him. Uh, Psalm 115, 3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatsoever he pleases. Uh, Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from the evil way. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. His son men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. If you take a verse like Deuteronomy 29, 29, The secret things belong unto the will our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. 
Luther looked at that and he says God has a secret will or he said a hidden will and he says God has a revealed will. A secret will and a revealed will. Now, the secret will of God, is that our responsibility or not? No, that is not our responsibility. That's what separates God and us. If you and I knew God's secret will in that, we would be God. God's secret will. The revealed will. Where is God's revealed will? It's in the book, the Bible. Right. That is God's revealed will. That is what we are responsible for. That's what we are responsible for. Now, I think I shared this on Wednesday night, 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's not his secret will. That's his revealed will. And when you and I know God's revealed will in Scripture, a lot of God's revealed will is Jesus revealed God's will, uh, Matthew 5, 17. Um, the apostles' prayers, the apostles' letters inspired in that. When we know God's will, then you see we don't have to end, add at the end of the prayer, if it be thy will. A.W. Pink says if we add that at the end of our prayer, then it's a false humility. We are denigrating God's revealed will. And in fact, he says a lot of what we do is we are paupers when it comes to the blessings and what Christ wants to bestow on us because we go around with that kind of an attitude. When God has revealed it, think of James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally, and it braideth not, will be, and it will be given him. God is there waiting for you and I to ask for wisdom so that he'll give it to us. So are we supposed to sit there in our prayer closet and say, Lord, please give me wisdom if it is thy will. Huh? No. We have the clear teaching of Scripture, the revealed will of God, that says he's ready and willing to give us wisdom. But... He wants us to ask. See, he wants us to ask. Evidence our dependence on him. And glorify him. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, when it comes to the church, the supreme objective of the Christian walk for all of us is that you and I do God's will. Is that we do God's will. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. There's the uh, picture in Scripture, foremost picture of the sovereignty of God. He's the potter, we're the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I'm waiting, yielded and still. Okay. The three... At, uh, the three um, God's sovereignty, when you look at things that flesh out his sovereignty, there are three things that flesh out God's sovereignty. One is the will of God. Two is his freedom, his autonomy, and his omnipotence. But you see how this ties in. The will of God ties in with his sovereignty. His sovereignty. Also related then to his freedom and his omnipotence. Okay. Now, with that kind of as a background there, an introduction then. Who do you and I look to for a model when it comes to doing God's will. Christ. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He said in John 8, 29, 
The Father who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. I do always those things that please him. I do always those things that please him. So when Jesus came to Luke 22, 42, saying, Father, if it is I will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So Jesus, you see, was always doing the Father's will. That was what pleased the Father. And this, commentator says, this defines contentment. You and I want to be satisfied in Christ Jesus for all that God has given us to be satisfied in Christ, for all that God has given us in Christ, is be content is here. Mirror Christ then. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. There's true content to see in that. Okay, Christ is our model. Now, let's look at, at the first thing, which is the negative response. In verse 13 and 14 is the ignoring of God's will. Ignoring of God's will. Now, these are kind of people are practical atheists. Uh, they go around and pretend that God does not exist. They pretend that God does not exist. Psalm 10.4. The wicked in his proud countenance does not see God. God is in none of his thoughts. Okay. This type of person. Verse 13. Come now. You'll notice in 5.1 it says the same thing. Come now. In other words, he says, wake up. Take heed. Give ear. Come now, you who are saying, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Now, you'll notice the five I wills in verse 13. Who else had five I wills? Satan, where? Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, the five I wills of Satan. The five I wills of Satan. So, they have their five I wills here, these people who ignore God's will. They choose their own time. They choose their own time, today or tomorrow. We'll go to such such. Okay? Today or tomorrow. So they choose their own location. They say, oh, we're going to go to such and such a city. And they choose their own duration. They choose their own duration. They said, well, we're going to spend a year there. Okay? And then they go and choose their own enterprise. We're going to engage in business. We're going to engage in business. And then they choose their own goal. What's their own goal? Profit. So there's the five I wills. Now, the question for you and I is this. Is it wrong, then, to have business acumen, to plan, to strategize, uh, to engage in business, uh, to desire to make a profit? No. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. In fact, the history of Christianity is tied to just those things. You'll find he becomes poor who deals with a slack hand. The hand of the diligent makes rich. Proverbs 10.4. See? Now, what is the issue here then? Right. The issue is here, they are excluding God. That is the issue. The issue in it is all they are excluding God. There's no, there's no Psalm 57 too. I will cry unto God most high, unto God who performs all things for me. You see. If they go out and make a profit, what are they doing? Are they thanking God? Are they, they're boasting in it, see. They're not, they're not saying, well, I made this money, thank you God that it's a successful business and I am going to endeavor then to give back, you see, to you and for the furtherance of your kingdom. None of that whatsoever. 
A good example of this in Scripture, of course, is the rich fool. Luke 12, 13 through 21. Luke 12, 13 through 21. Isn't it interesting, too, when you read this passage, let's just glance at this passage, Luke 12, 13 through 21, the parable of the rich fool. Jesus says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable of them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? When I read this, I always, it's always the personal pronouns that just come out. He says, So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barn, my barns, build greater, and there I will store all my crops, my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul be required to you, of you then whose will these things be which you have been provided? So he said, he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. See, that's the end then of the man who excludes God then, does not include God in all of his planning that he does. Now, when we get to verse 14, there's two reasons given in verse 14 why it's so foolish to exclude God. Why is it so foolish to exclude God? Two reasons. Let's read verse 14. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and that it vanishes away. So, two reasons why it's so foolish to exclude God is the unknowns of life And second is the brevity of life. The unknowns of life and the brevity of life. Remember I've shared that example before, P.P. Bliss, when he was burned and age 37 years of age, when the train went off the trestle, he was going back to Chicago for Christmas, uh, left the Ira Sankey Moody crusade in New York and going back to Chicago to be with friends and family for Christmas. And the train of over 100 cars went off the trestle plunged 100 feet, some feet below, and the cars were burned, over 175 people burned to death, and was, that was P.P. Bliss and his wife, and in that trunk there was uh, part of a hymn that he was working on, I know not what awaits me, God kindly veils my eyes. I know not what awaits me, God kindly veils my eyes. Think of all the unknowns of life that are there, and, and uh, they act so brazenly, you see, these people that ignore God's will, think that they can plan this and do this and all of that, but they're just like that rich fool. God says, tonight your soul is required of you, and then whose will all these things be that you have gathered? And then think of the brevity of life. Your life is a vapor. The illustration I always use when we go out in the wintertime, you know, and you, you see your breath. You got the vapor, and a couple seconds, poof, it's gone. See, poof, it's gone. Um, look at uh, Psalm 144, verse 4. Psalm 144, verse 4. Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. See. And Job said, my life is swifter than what? A weaver's shuttle. My uh, mom's dad used to do rugs. Uh, on the shuttle, on the weave, weaving of that. And boy, when that thing gets going, it's boom, you know, just, he really worked that thing fast. My life is faster than a uh, weaver's shuttle. Look at Job 14, 1 and 2. Job 14, 1 and 2. Man is born of a woman, is a few days full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower, fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Flees like a shadow and does not continue. Now, go back to the book of James. The second thing then is the negative here. The second negative is a denying of God's will. 
a denying of God's will, verse 16. Denying of God's will, verse 16. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Kau kau am I there, the Greek word for boast, it can be positive in that you're loud-mouthed in the sense of rejoicing of what God has done in your life. Think of David in Psalm 49 where he rejoiced in the great assembly of all the things that God had done for him. It's all right. Let her loose. See? And that type of praise of God and all that. But then there's also that the negative side is that, you know, they're boasting in themselves, patting themselves on the back and, and flaunting uh, their own deeds and all that. They boast in their arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Poneris, the word there for evil is the same that's used for the devil as a title for devil, the devil. In 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world is, is of the wicked one. Well, that wicked one is Panaris. That's that type of evil there. And it's evil. And why is it evil? There again, they're not acknowledging God. They're denying God's will. And they're denying then Psalm 57, 2. I will cry unto God most high, unto God who performs all things for me. You see, the what's, everything is from... Um, James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift is from above. See, comes down from the Father's life. The tomb is no variableness nor shadow of turning. There's that poem that says, I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. Well, what an empty boast. What an empty boast. Uh, the original boaster, again, you, we could say was Satan in Isaiah 14, after he rebelled against God, I will exalt my throne above the Most High and all that. You know where he ended up. You know where he ended up. Now, the third negative one is the disobeying of God's will. That is verse 17. The disobeying of God's will. This is the third negative response then. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Why is this one, the third negative response, more serious than the first one, ignoring God's will, and the next one, denying God's will? Why is this disobedience here more serious? Therefore, to him who knows to do good, Luke 12, 47 and 48. Let's look at that. Luke 12, 47 and 48. Luke 12, 47 and 48. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. You see, they have the greater accountability there. And this is even more serious than a, disobey, a disobeying of God's will. Remember, I've shared this before, and Dr. Howard Hendricks, who taught at, at uh, Dallas Theological Seminar, Seminary, and looking at this verse, he says, in the New Testament, to know and not to do is not to know at all. To know and not to do is not to know at all. What's the theme verse in James? James 1.22. Be not deceived. What does it say? Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See? Then we get back to what, what um, G. Campbell Morgan said again. G. Campbell Morgan said, trust and obey. Two elements in following Jesus. You can't obey unless you trust, but, ah, but you can trust in a general way and not obey. Ah, you see how serious that is. How serious that is. Think of all the people who profess Christ, sit in church pews, week after week after week, if they're hearing truth, if they're hearing God's revealed word, think of how they're increasing accountability as opposed to some native, say, in some backwoods in Africa or something that hasn't heard the gospel, per se. See. Now, 
let's look at the last one, which is the positive, and I skipped over that. And that's verse 15. Verse 15, those that acknowledge then, the fourth response is those that acknowledge and obey God's word. Acknowledge and obey God's word. W. Vine says, when a man obeys God, he gives the only possible evidence in his heart that he truly believes God. See, obeys God's will. And this is verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. You see the dependence there that is on God for everything. And this is where Deo Valente comes in, which is what? God willing. Hebrews 6.3. I've been at Reformed churches where they have the uh, commission of elders, installation of elders. And when they have the installation at the elders and the elders stand up and give their testimony on that and then their, their responsibilities are set before them, they always end with Hebrews 6.3. This we will do what? God permitting. God permitting. Deo Valente. In 1902, father, a young boy came down the stairs. I've shared this example before. There was a young boy that came down the stairs and his father was reading the newspaper and the mom was at the at the kitchen uh, stove, and the father was shaking his head. He says, this article should not be written this way. And what the article was about was the first coronation of a king that they were going to have in England in 64 years, of Prince Edward. And it announced that the coronation would occur on such and such a day. And the father was shaking his head because at the end of the article, they did not put the DV, the Deo Valente, Lord willing. And what happened on that set day of the coronation, King Edward VII had to have his coronation postponed because he had to have an emergency appendectomy. This we will do if the Lord wills. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he looked at Romans 12, 1 and 2, which are verses of worship, and you see, if you and I do God's will, that is an act of worship. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and what? Perfect will of God. And there again, he said, the ultimate objective of the walk of the Christian is obedience to God's will. Obedience to God's will. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that the words of this scripture will convict our hearts that it's very easy for us to say we trust in you and we will do this and that but when it comes to actually doing it, we don't follow through. Forgive us, dear Heavenly Father. Uh, I think of Paul. I delight to do the word of God in the inward man. We have a renewed heart, a new nature. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that is the delight of our heart that we would do it. I think of what Calvin said on Psalm 46 through 8. My ears you have opened. Then I said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me. I delight to do your will, O God your laws within my heart. May it be a delight of ours, dear Heavenly Father, as followers of Jesus Christ, as bondservants of yours, that we delight in doing your will. May we know your revealed will. We pray for the Spirit's illumination. Convict us of truth. Increase our wisdom, our understanding of it, so that we know more and more of your will and what is required of us as your bondservants. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that what others see in us, that they would see Christ, that we would walk as he walked, our perfect model of someone who perfectly obeyed your will as revealed in your word, in your law. I pray that would, again, be our desire, our passion. I pray also, dearly Father, that you'd 